Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Please take care of yourself. to Fruit Loops, episode 223, Bienvenidos Bitches and Buiti Binafi, and thank you for listening and for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and those who are othered, and most importantly, the victims, because contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cisgender, able-bodied white dudes. No. Wow. <laughs> These crimes <laughs> rarely get any public attention, and that is because, drum roll, please. Why? <laughs> the news is racist, allegedly. <laughs> and we are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy, a Black Latinx woman. And I'm Beth, and I just happen to be white. That's right. She is. And when we talk about racism, she never finds it necessary to be like, well, not all white people, Wendy, <laughs> because duh. <laughs> And we're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists, just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. All right, so who are we talking about today, Beth? Today's subject is Gerald Parker, a.k.a. the Bedroom Basher, a black man and serial killer responsible for a string of home invasion murders in Orange County, California in the late 70s. And this subject was suggested to us by True Dark Angel Shy on Twitter. Ooh, hip-hop air horns for True Dark Angel Shy. Yeah. Thank you so much, True Dark Angel Shy. Love, 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 love. So, um, before we get into it, uh, how you doing, friend? I'm doing good. I'm very busy right now. Oh so, my God. uh, yeah. 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 Everybody I've been talking to on the phone, like at work vendors and stuff uh-huh. i'm like oh hey how's it going oh i'm so busy so busy I'm like, oh my yeah. god me too i'm glad i'm not the only one i'm up to my eyeballs yeah. in <laughs> tps reports i just got off i worked for 12 hours today so oh my god yeah, i know Ugh. i know Ugh. in a mediation most of the time yes yeah, so you're busy and um you're gonna hire an assistant to help you um <laughs> You're going no. to take a vacation and somebody's going to do all your work for you. I, I am going to take a vacation okay. in March. Okay. okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, I too am very busy and it's just, I guess, embrace the suck is what I'm trying to figure out yes. how to do right now. Uh, <laughs> the weather's warming up. It's tax season almost. And uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> We're alive, though. That's good, right? Yes. Uh, so yeah. now let's get into some listener laters. Well, hello, angels. Thank you. All right. What's in that bag, friend? Well, I wanted to say thank you to Personnel Touch and Killa Eastax mm. for your five star reviews. Thank you so much. I saw those two, yes. and was, uh, there's really wonderful people out there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I wanted to say, please send any questions or comments to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. <laughs> and we may feature it on a future episode. 
But if you don't want us to, just let us know and we won't. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Well, we got two new Patreons this week. Right on. Returning champ, Semenchi, a.k.a. Marlene, Mean Green Marlene, yeah. and NB. And right by on. the way, just a reminder, you know, we understand that the struggle is real. I can't tell you how many Patreon accounts I have and I have to cancel because uh oh <laughs> I have can't other bills to pay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we totally understand you you can come in and out. We are not going anywhere. So And we're not judgmental either. <laughs> no, 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 no. We oh my do what gosh. You gotta come do. on, Joe Byron, yeah. forgive our student loans already, please. <laughs> um but we we understand. We appreciate it. We just appreciate you rocking with us so much. So thank yeah. you, Semenchi and N B is a new Patreon and here is your tune. <clears throat> sing it like Semenchi. Whoa, whoa. Sing it like NB. Whoa, whoa. Sing it like Aretha. Whoa, whoa. Sing it like Alicia. Whoa, whoa. I sound great. <laughs> when I'm potting in the shower. Ooh. All the fruities give me powers. <laughs> when I'm potting in the shower. Funky! Thank you! <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, just a little sign of our appreciation. We love you guys. Um, so now we're going to take a quick break and we're going to get into the story when we come back. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour a day? Hmm. Spend more time with your kids? Go to the hmm. gym? Hmm. Work on a hobby? Take a nap? <laughs> Can you do all those things in 60 minutes? Just kidding. <laughs> you know, a lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. Yeah. But what we do with that time, we don't always know. But the best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what it is. And therapy can help you figure that out. Find what matters to you most and make it a priority so that you can find the time to do more of it. Yeah. Therapy isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. It's for everyone. Mm -hmm. It can empower you to be the best version of yourself. And I've been in and out of therapy most of my life. Same. And it has had such a positive influence on my life that I honestly do not know who I would be without therapy. And I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know either. <laughs> Listen, Bev and I have both used BetterHelp. Yeah. And we love it. And if you are thinking of starting therapy, you should give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can also switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash fruit today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash fruit. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. And we're back. Remind us, Beth, who is our subject again today? Our subject today is Gerald Parker, a.k.a. The Bedroom Basher, a serial killer responsible for six murders in Orange County, California in the late 70s. And as far as bad people who did bad things in California, I would say the 70s was their heyday, no? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Faux fo show. We got Manson. Uh, we got uh, Golden State, the Golden State guy. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, really all I can think about right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, let's get into our love and light section where we just offer up love and light to the loved ones of the victims. This was also heavy for the communities uh, in which these crimes occurred. So we want to say love and light to the communities as well and rest in paradise to all of the victims. And here are their names. Sandra Fry was 17. Kimberly Rollins was 21. Jane D. actually survived. Marilyn Carlton, 31. Diana Green was 20 years old. She survived. And her stillborn baby was also a victim, Chantal Green. Deborah Kennedy was 24 years old. 
Deborah Senor was 17 years old, Aida Demirjuran survived, and Paula S. was 13 years old, and Paula survived as well. So now let's get into the setting. Take us there, Beth. Well, the murders took place in Orange County, California in the 70s, but our subject today spent much of his formative years in Logan Heights, San Diego. Logan Heights is one of the oldest communities in San Diego and was established in 1867 wow. on land where the Kumeye people had lived for thousands of years. Oh, that's a new one. Kumeye. Yeah. New to me. Obviously yes. not new, yeah, to, obviously not not new, new. to the world. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, that's because we're both fans of um, Night Country. And oh, yeah. um, a lot of the language that people include, and I'm guilty of this too sometimes, the, what we use when we're referring to indigenous folks is like negative, like they're like they're they're suffering and they um, are going extinct. Right. But there is there's a resilience that uh I've observed in indigenous communities. They're not going anywhere. So, yeah, we don't have to talk about them like they're not here. But anyway, in the 1880s, Logan Heights became a significant subdivision in San Diego. And during the great boom of that period was the location of many beautiful homes. The neighborhood grew slowly but consistently. The area had all the attributes of a good neighborhood. It was accessible to the central area, had fertile soil, and was close to water, yet high enough to offer views of the bay. Sounds luxurious. Yeah, it does. In 1891, a horse and mule drawn rail car line was built into the area, which was replaced the next year by the San Diego Electric Railway, Ooh. which offered service from downtown San Diego to various Logan Avenue points. Mm. That's fancy. It is. Perhaps because of the ease of accessibility to downtown San Diego, mm -hmm. the neighborhood business development lagged, so it was still somewhat rural. Hard to imagine uh, San Diego. That area, rural. yeah, <laughs> being rural. Yeah. People who are migrants to the area came from many walks of life, the ethnic composition of Logan Heights was fairly typical of other San Diego neighborhoods and included Black folks, Mexican-American people, Asian people, and various people of European ethnic groups. Restrictive covenants and housing contracts were used in many areas of San Diego, including Logan Heights. And although Mexican-American people were scattered throughout Logan Heights, Black folks were fairly concentrated along just a few blocks. The semi-rural lifestyle of Logan Heights began to fade shortly after 1900. In 1905, as the area grew, the local business base expanded. Logan Heights' business district reached its height of prosperity in the 1920s. Ah, the Roaring Twenties! Yes. With jazz and the Hannibal <laughs> Renaissance. <laughs> as Logan Heights became a less desirable place to live, it experienced white flight. Other ethnic groups took their place, and by the late 1920s, this is really early for this, mm. Logan Heights was considered a residential district of Black people, Mexican-American people, and Asian people. And today, it is majority Latinx. In 1963, I-5 was constructed. I hate that fucking freeway. And it bisected the community. So it literally... Uh, Went right went through the community. right through a community. There were people living there, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> so what yeah. happened to their houses, etc. In 1969, the Coronado Bay Bridge opened with its on-ramps and support pylons towering over the community. These developments had a devastating effect on Logan Heights as families and businesses found themselves displaced. Attempting to restore some vitality to the neighborhood, residents asked the city to build a park where people could go and rest and where children could play. Mario Solis, a resident of the community, found out that construction of a California Highway Patrol substation and parking lot had begun while the plea for a community park had gone unheard. Mm. And we talked we've talked about this before, how they will build um, highways, parking lots right in the middle of where BIPOC and poor people live. Yeah. And they don't listen to them when they're asking for the community said, we want this. We need this. And they ignored it. Yeah. Word spread. And on April 22nd, 1970, the residents of Logan Heights walked down to the site under the Coronado Bridge with shovels, pickaxes and rakes and constructed a park for the community. Oh, that's beautiful. Halting yeah. construction on the CHP substation 
and giving birth to Chicano Park. Oh, I love this. Yeah, it's a great story. Yeah. Chicano Park is located under the Coronado Bay Bridge, which connects San Diego proper with Coronado and is a 7.9 acre open space for residents of Southwest San Diego. Mural art forms adorn the bridge support pillars. A kiosk resembling an Aztec temple is located in the park. That is so rad. Yeah. Residential displacement by industry has resulted in a mixed use residential slash industrial area, further eroding residential land values. Industries brought an estimated 50,000 jobs to the community, but residents say most of the jobs have gone to outsiders. The noise, odors, traffic, and associated problems have also hurt the community image of Logan Heights, not to mention their health from all that shit. Yeah. But anyway, uh, let's get into the early life of Gerald Parker. What do you got, Beth? Gerald Parker was born in 1955 in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh. He was one of 10 siblings. Hmm. His mother died giving birth to her 10th child when Jerry was just eight years old. Hmm. His father then abandoned the family. That is, that's really sad. sad. Jerry yeah. lived with his grandmother for a few months, and while there, he got in trouble for sniffing glue and was sent to juvenile hall. Afterwards, he and a brother went to live with an older cousin, Florence Russell, in Logan Heights, San Diego. And she was quite a bit older. She had kids and mm -hmm. everything. Okay. Auntie Florence? Yes, Auntie Florence. According to Florence, Jerry's mother's death and his father's abandonment, quote, broke up the whole family, destroyed them, unquote. Mm. And Jerry was never the same after that. But Florence raised Jerry the best she could, treated him as her own child, and she said that he treated her with respect and kindness. Jerry went to high school at Boys Republic, a private all-boys school for troubled adolescents located in Chino Hills, California. He did well there and won some awards. However, Jerry later told a psychiatrist that between the ages of 7 and 15, he regularly sniffed glue, paint, and paint thinner, began using marijuana at age 11, used PCP, mushrooms, LSD, and injected speedballs, which is a combo. Uh, may I have the speedball combo? Oh, we don't serve that here. This is in and out. Oh, well, uh, uh, it's a combination of heroin and cocaine. Can you get it to me now? Nope, still just a burger joint. In 1973, at the age of 18, he joined the Marine Corps. And after basic training, he was stationed in Adak, Alaska, where he said that he first tried alcohol. He claimed that he then began drinking every day, including when he was on duty. I don't think we should be surprised by his his continued uh, reaching for substances. things yeah, yeah, to cope and escape. And there's no intervention anywhere in those, what, eight, nine years of his life. Um, so yeah. it, it makes sense. But Jerry met another Marine named Albert Garcia when they were both stationed in Adak. They became roommates when they were stationed in Tustin, California from 1974 to 1977. According to Albert, the two partied together on the weekends, drinking alcohol and sometimes smoking marijuana and PCP. I was going to say, wow, that sounds like a fun weekend. But then you add PCP and I'm PCP, not interested. Yeah, no, yeah. no thank you. <laughs> Albert described Jerry as intelligent, quiet, mellow, very respectable, and a model Marine who was promoted to staff sergeant in five years. He said he never saw Jerry get into a fight and thought Jerry had good control over his temper. He did not believe Jerry had an alcohol problem, and he had never seen Jerry behave violently after using alcohol or drugs. Retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel Larry Huster, Jerry's commanding officer from 1978 through 1979 while he was a staff sergeant assigned to a heavy transport helicopter squadron in Tustin, later testified at trial regarding Jerry's job performance. He said that Jerry was the material chief for the squadron, a difficult job that served a very critical function relating to the flight readiness of the squadron and required exceptional dedication to the task at hand. He received outstanding evaluations from very demanding superiors and had the tremendous honor of being recommended for warrant officer's school. Mm. Kuster saw Jerry on a weekly basis and thought he was a good Marine. He never knew Jerry to be intoxicated or hungover or to have a drug or alcohol problem. He explained the Marine Corps had a zero tolerance policy for the use of drugs or alcohol while on duty especially for aviation units yeah. where lives were on the line. 
And minimum performance could not be tolerated, even in training situations. So how did he do it? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm really baffled yeah. by this story. I don't know if uh, his reporting of the amount of drugs and alcohol he was doing mm, uh, was not true. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But Kuster did not believe it would be possible for someone on drugs or alcohol to perform Jerry's job as it required an exceptional amount of motivation. But according to Jerry, he drank a case of beer and a half a fifth of vodka every day for a 10 to 11 year period. He also claimed to have suffered five head injuries, three of which resulted in unconsciousness. That's a lot. But yeah, if you've got your serial killer bingo card ready. Head injury. Yeah, head injury. <laughs> uh, so he claimed that his drinking and drug use reached the point where he was not reporting to work. And by mid-1979, he was about to be kicked out of the military. However, although he was dishonorably discharged in 1980, it was for felony conviction, not for substance abuse. Parker said he had always had problems meeting women and never developed relationships with them. He never married and never had a girlfriend. And he was a good looking guy. He was mm -hmm. a decent looking guy. Yeah. He later told a psychiatrist that he, quote, always thought of raping women, unquote. Mm. So um, there was something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Something right. Yeah. But, I, you know, we'll get into it in our takeaways. I mean, that yeah. that that primary relationship with with the matriarch or the female in his life who was supposed to, you know, like be there for him. Right was severed to she the death. She was gone. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, now let's get into the timeline. So from 1975 to 1978, Parker was stationed at the Marine base in Tustin. His only close friend was Albert Garcia. And between 1978 and 1979, Parker was transferred from Tustin to El Toro, where he spent just a few months. He described his lifestyle at this time as revolving around drinking and using drugs. According to Parker's later confession, on December 1st, 1978, he was driving around when he parked near an apartment complex near Buena Park, climbed a fence, and went in through the back of the complex. Mm. In one apartment, he saw a girl sitting at the table in the kitchen with her back to the living room window. It was 17-year-old Sandra Fry. Sandra was one of 10 siblings. Her sister Judith described her as very compassionate and loving the kind of person who would bring home stray animals. Sandra had moved out of the family home just three days earlier. Parker said he went through an open bedroom window, and after watching Sandra for several minutes, he came up behind her and hit her on the head two or three times with a two-by-four. He then dragged her into her bedroom and laid her on the bed, took off her underwear and his pants, and then ejaculated on her. Mm. He then exited through the same window that he had entered. It's... Uh, this is so, so random, right? Yeah. He just pulled over somewhere and noticed somebody sitting yeah, in the window. So I think he was a peeping Tom mm -hmm. and had been for a long time. Okay. Okay. Thank you, OG of True Crime. <laughs> <laughs> so when Sandra's roommate, Georgina Stevenson, returned home that evening, she found Sandra in her bedroom lying unresponsive across the bed and nude from the waist down. Her blouse was pulled up, exposing her bra and there were obvious signs of trauma to her head. Paramedics transported her to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. Mm. A pathologist determined that Sandra had died from hemorrhaging caused by cerebral lacerations and skull fractures from an unknown number of blows to her head with a blunt instrument. Contradicting Parker's claim that Sandra was unaware of his presence before he struck her in the head and rendered her unconscious, there were signs of a struggle in the apartment and Sandra suffered injuries to her face and neck that were consistent with a struggle. A latent fingerprint was lifted from the bedroom window that was years later matched to Parker's left index finger. So this is another thing that um, is confusing about this story. Mm -hmm. Parker, in almost every case, says that they were sleeping or he came up behind them or something like that. They didn't know he was there, so there was no struggle. Yeah. Um, but... Clearly there were signs of struggle. Yeah. 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 So I don't know why why he, he did that, but yeah, he's he's lying. <laughs> okay, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> On March 31st, 1979, 21-year-old Kimberly Rollins 
was alone in a one-bedroom apartment in Costa Mesa that she shared with a roommate named Roberta. Kimberly had just moved out of the apartment she had shared with her sister Cheryl. Cheryl described Kimberly as her best friend and a very happy and giving person who wanted to have many children. The sister's plan had been for Kimberly to help Cheryl through her first two years of college, and then Cheryl would help Kimberly with her first two years of college. That's so sweet. That's did, sweet. Did you yeah. and Minnie make any deals like that? Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we should have, but we didn't. <laughs> I was just wondering. Okay. <laughs> a friend had left her ID at the apartment, and at about 1130, she came over with her date to retrieve it. The couple spoke with Kimberly for a short time before leaving sometime after midnight. Kimberly asked them to leave the door unlocked on their way out because Roberta didn't have a key to the apartment and Kimberly was going to go to bed. According to Parker, he was outside an apartment window listening to three people inside talking. The man and one of the women left, leaving the other woman alone in the apartment. He then drove around for about an hour before coming back. He entered the apartment through the unlocked front door with the intent to rape the woman. He found the woman sleeping in the bedroom in the nude. Parker said that, and remember, this is all from Parker's point of view, Okay, right? Mm -hmm. Parker said that he struck her two or three times with a two by four and attempted to rape her. He said he left the apartment the same way he entered and threw the two by four onto a garage roof. Are two by fours just things people in the 70s had lying around their house? Well, that's what Parker claims, that they were just lying around everywhere, but uh, I don't I don't think so. I don't that know. That sounds I don't know where weird. he got these yeah. two-by-fours. <laughs> these just random two-by-fours. <laughs> just fours. laying around everywhere. Yeah, okay. Just, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I wasn't around in the 70s, so I don't know. You know? I don't remember seeing two-by-fours okay. everywhere. <laughs> okay, thanks, Beth. Uh, so Kimberly's roommate, Roberta, returned home at about 4.45 a.m. on April 1st. The front door of the apartment was ajar. Hearing what sounded like a heavy sigh or forced breath, Roberta went into the bedroom and found Kimberly unresponsive, wearing only an open bathrobe and lying half on and half off of her bed. Kimberly's face had been badly beaten. Believing Kimberly to be dead and thinking the person responsible could be inside their apartment, Roberta fled to a neighbor's house to call the police. Kimberly was pronounced dead soon after the paramedics arrived. That was smart, though, for her to go and call. Yeah. In a safe place. Right. If you love true crime and you don't want to die. I mean, that's a great tip. Uh, yeah. So an autopsy showed that Kimberly had died from brain contusions with subdural hematoma as the result of multiple skull fractures from a beating with a blunt object. Semen was found at the scene, which much later, much, much later in the 90s, yeah. was matched to Parker's DNA. On July 19th, 1979, Jane D., who was living alone in her Costa Mesa apartment, went to bed between 11 and 11.30 p.m. According to Parker, he had been drinking that night and entered the apartment through an open dining room window. He found Jane sleeping in the nude and hit her in the head with a two-by-four. But according to Jane, she was awakened by noises in the hallway. When she went to investigate, a man grabbed her and told her to shut up, after which she lost consciousness. During the brief encounter, Jane did not notice any signs of his being intoxicated. Another one where... Was he drunk? Yeah. Or, I mean, if yeah. you're drunk, how in the world am I supposed to parkour my ass up through a window? <laughs> I don't, without hurting yeah. myself. Kill, yeah. I mean. And, I, and if somebody's drunk, you smell the alcohol. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. So the next morning, a friend coming to see Jane found the apartment store open a few inches and Jane lying unconscious in bed on her back. Her eyes were swollen. There were scratches on her face and bruising behind her ear. She looked like, quote, a prize fighter after a fight, unquote. Mm, that paints the picture. Yeah. Jane was taken to the hospital, where she remained in a coma for about four weeks, but she survived. However, she had suffered an ear-to-ear -ear skull fracture and required a permanent tracheostomy as a result of having been strangled. Wow. Yeah. And as a result of permanent nerve damage, she had problems chewing and difficulty forming words. DNA extracted from Jane's rape kit was later matched to Parker's profile. Have you ever wondered about things that go bump in the night or objects in the sky? or other things you just couldn't explain, then join me, Jim Howard, on my podcast, The Mauer Report. 
Each week, you'll find engaging conversations with guests who are authors, historians, and scholars who lend their expertise as we discuss current events and venture into the fringe and paranormal. The Mauer Report hits controversies head-on, yet remains conversational, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any other major podcast platform. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. On September 14, 1979, 31-year-old Marilyn Carlton and her 9-year-old son Joseph, then known as Joey, were living in an apartment in Costa Mesa. Joseph described his mother as, quote, everything a young boy like myself at the time would want in a mother. She cared, protected, guided, put me before herself, and loved me like only a mother could. She was everything to me, unquote. Mm. Parker describes scaling a back wall and entering Marilyn's apartment through an unlocked sliding glass door. Marilyn was asleep in her bed with a nightlight on. Parker hit her in the head three or four times with the intention of knocking her unconscious so that he could rape her. Parker said when he exited the bedroom, he bumped into Joey in the dark hallway and the boy asked, quote, what's wrong with mommy, unquote. Parker did not say anything, moved the boy aside and left the apartment the same way he entered. Joseph later testified how his mother, screaming his name, woke him in the middle of the night. Joseph said he was at her bedroom door when it opened and a dark-skinned man pushed past him, ran down the hallway, and left the apartment. Inside the bedroom, Joseph turned on the light and found his mother lying on the floor, propped up against her nightstand, incoherent and bleeding. When he realized he could not stop the bleeding, he called the operator. Mm. No 911 at that time. Oh, thank you. But also, I yeah. feel so bad for little Joey. Yeah. Joey met the police outside saying his mother had been hurt, and he directed the officer to Marilyn's room. Marilyn was found covered with blood with a large wound on top of her skull. Paramedics transported Marilyn to the hospital where she died the next day from subarachnoid and subdural hemorrhage and cerebral contusions as a result of blunt force trauma. Mm. In September of 1979, 20-year-old Diana Green, who was nine months pregnant, was living in an apartment in Tustin with her husband, Kevin, who was in the Marines. The two were very young when they married and had a somewhat volatile relationship, as a lot of us do in our early relationships, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, too young, really. So, yeah. To, <laughs> to, 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 to be able to figure out how to work relationships. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's hard. Yeah. On the night of September 30th, they had gotten into an argument and Kevin left the apartment in kind of a huff to go get some fast food. He unfortunately did not lock the door behind him when he left. He noticed a black man loitering at the complex, but thought nothing of it. According to Parker, he was drunk that night and he parked near the Greens apartment complex and started walking around. He heard the argument between Diana and Kevin and saw Kevin leave. Oh my God. Also... Isn't it illegal to drive drunk and drink and drive in the 70s? Oh, Did I we think, have that yet? Um, you know, I, it was, but it, they weren't so severe about it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just wondering. Yeah. But I, I think he didn't care. I mean. <laughs> right. And that, that's that's one of my takeaways because I heard his his confession tape or like his police interviews. And he just uh -huh. sounds like somebody who, who d doesn't Does really not care. Does give a fuck. Yeah. 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 So after waiting a bit and drinking more alcohol, he entered the apartment through the unlocked front door. Diana, who was noticeably pregnant, she was actually nine months pregnant and uh, two weeks From her after due her due date. Oh, yeah. oh my. Yeah. So she was about to give birth and uh, she was lying on the bed in the bedroom. Parker hit her in the head with a board he had picked up outside of the apartment and then raped her. Oh, my God. At 2.15 a.m., a law enforcement officer responded to a call from the apartment and was met outside by Kevin, who appeared to be in a state of shock and said his wife had been injured. Officers found Diana in the bedroom, unconscious and lying on the bed nude. She was having difficulty breathing and was bleeding from a two-inch hole in the middle of her forehead, mm. as well as from her ear and nose. There was blood everywhere. 
The wound to her head was so deep it exposed brain tissue and was so pronounced the officer initially believed she had been shot. Diana was transported to the hospital. Initially, an obstetrician was able to detect a fetal heartbeat, but several hours later, her unborn fetus, Chantal, ceased to have vital signs and was delivered stillborn via C-section. Diana spent 10 days in a coma and remained in the hospital for about three weeks. When she regained consciousness, she had total amnesia and could not remember anyone, let alone what had happened to her. She had to learn to talk and spell all over again, a process that took years. Oh, and then imagine um, learning that your your baby um, yeah. didn't survive. I just yeah. can't imagine how difficult that was. Kevin told officers that he was not home at the time of the attack. He said that he had left the apartment, went to Jack in the Box for food, and when he returned, he found his wife had been attacked. An employee at Jack in the Box told police that Kevin had been there, and police noted at the time that the food in his possession was warm. Kevin also told officers about the black man loitering at the complex. It's interesting that in this case, the black man did it excuse didn't yeah. go very far. But un- <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, it is a common excuse in Western society. Right. And welcome to Culture Corner with Wendy and Beth. The a black man did it defense is a real thing. And uh, throughout much of American history, it's been one of the most effective ways for a white person who had misbehaved or committed a crime to evade accountability and use a black person as a scapegoat for the actual yeah. culprit. Um, but again, right. it, I, I'm pointing it out, but it, it that's it didn't happen that's in this case, which this is case. very yeah. strange. Yeah. 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 Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, in this case, police zoned in on Kevin as a suspect when the rape kit came back and the sample taken matched his blood type. There was no DNA testing at the time, and blood typing was one way used to narrow down a suspect. So there's only a few blood types. Um, o, but, A, B, anything else? <laughs> yeah, O positive, O negative, what, A, B, A, B, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bunch, yeah a bunch of letters. Like it's alphabet soup. Of, yeah, a bunch blood. of letters, mm-hmm. but... Not a lot of blood types. So it's it's really only a way to narrow down a suspect. You can't use it to pinpoint. To, to pinpoint. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Is what I'm trying to say. Yes. <laughs> but also interestingly is that most black people are O type, positive or oh. negative, including myself. Wow. Hello. And I thought this was interesting because of the DNA and blood. And you know, you know how it gets down. Approximately 45% of Caucasians are type O positive or negative, but 51% of black people. Uh, or African-Americans, and 57% of Latinx or Hispanic people are type O. Oh. Minority and diverse populations, therefore, play a critical role in meeting the constant need for blood. Hmm. Uh, call it a culture corner, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I am also a type O. I know. We're the same blood type. <laughs> <laughs> so Kevin's fate was sealed when Diana, quote unquote, remembered that Kevin had attacked her. And you have to remember that she had a major brain injury, and right. one show I watched, I, it was uh, Cold Case Files or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I watched that yeah. one too. Mm-hmm. They were talking about how um, they cautioned the family not to feed her information because she would form a memory around it. Right. Yeah. And that's what happened. Well, I, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know exactly what happened. Okay. But okay. She, she said she recalled Kevin hitting her with his keys okay. and who knows maybe he did at one time hit her with his keys mm-hmm. i don't know mm-hmm. but maybe she decided that that's that's what happened that night okay anyway neighbors remembered hearing what they thought was the greens fighting on the night of the attack which is what happened because mm-hmm. they were fighting mm-hmm. and noted that the couple fought often during the course of their short marriage which was true yeah kevin didn't he didn't shy away from that no know? he yeah. was like yep that's what happened mm-hmm. but uh he did not attack his wife right so three months after the attack kevin green was arrested and charged with assault with a deadly weapon and the murder of his full-term daughter. Diana's brain damage from the trauma was so severe that when the trial went to court a year after the incident, she still had trouble giving a coherent testimony and struggled to spell her own last name for the court record. But Kevin was convicted of the second-degree murder of Chantel and of assaulting and attempting to murder his wife. He was committed to prison in November of 1980 for a term of 15 years to life. 
On October 6th, 1979, 24-year-old Deborah Kennedy was home alone in a Tustin apartment. Late that night, or during the early morning hours, Parker said he took a mallet he found in the back of a pickup truck parked close by and entered Deborah's apartment through a window that was cracked open. It's interesting how he's going to these places and just finding weapons to use. Finding weapons, finding, I mean, finding weapons and finding unlocked doors and windows. Yeah. Uh, So I think he's looking for unlocked doors and windows. And I don't know about the weapons, but I have a hard time believing that he is finding two by fours everywhere. And I mean, don't you think he would have brought the weapon with him? I think so. I mean, his... uh, I don't know what, I really don't know what to believe. Part of me thinks, okay, so if this was a predominantly black and brown working class like area, it would make sense if there were like pickup trucks, people who worked um, in construction, people who worked doing landscaping and stuff like that. Yeah, pool work. Yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense that there would be a lot of pickup trucks and tools and supplies around, um, but always available to him seems yeah. so convenient. Yeah. Like I can't I can never find a pen. I have to write all the time, <laughs> but I can never find a pen. Uh, you know, and if I had Parker's luck, I would never be out of pens. There'd be pens everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> so when he entered the living room, he saw Deborah sleep on the floor leaning against the couch with the television on. She had a blanket over her. But Parker claimed that she was not wearing any clothes, which would be weird, but okay. He hit her on the head with the mallet, then raped her. When Deborah's sister returned to the apartment the next day at about 6 p.m., the front door was open and Deborah was lying naked in an exaggerated spread eagle position on a blood soaked mattress on the floor of her bedroom, covered with a knitted shawl. Deborah was dead. She had massive blunt force trauma to her face and head. And the pathologist who performed the autopsy said her injuries would have required at least five blows from a blunt instrument delivered with a large amount of force. Mm. Later testing of the semen swabbed from Deborah's body revealed a DNA profile that matched Parker. On October 20th, 1979, Deborah Chamberlain and 17-year-old Deborah Sr. went together to a party in Fountain Valley, California. Because both are named Deborah, we're going to call Deborah Chamberlain, Deborah C, and Deborah Sr. just Deborah. About 10:30 p.m., Deborah left in Deborah C's car to return home alone to the apartment they shared in Costa Mesa. Deborah C was going to get a ride home from a friend. According to Parker, that night he pretended to be a jogger in the neighborhood while hmm. he looked in windows. Wow. Yeah. He saw Deborah's apartment was empty and he entered through a bathroom window. How did he see that her apartment was empty? He was looking through the windows and peeking Mm -hmm. through every window. The math ain't mathing. So he's a creeper. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he'd been hiding. He said he'd been hiding in the bathroom for about 20 minutes when Deborah came home. Okay. So when Deborah fell asleep on the couch, Parker exited the bathroom. Oh, he was already in the house. Yeah. Exited the bathroom and hit Deborah in the head two or three times with a two by four, rendering her unconscious. He then carried her into one of the bedrooms, laid her on the floor, removed her underwear, and raped her. Deborah C. arrived about 2 30 a.m. and found Deborah lying on the floor of her bedroom near the foot of the bed, unclothed except for a pair of socks. She had suffered severe head trauma and her hair was matted with blood. A torn blouse and unsnapped bra had been pulled up around her shoulders. Buttons from the blouse were found on the floor next to her body. A green towel had partially been wrapped around her neck. Torn underwear was lying on a pair of shoes near the bed, and the contents of a purse were on the floor near her feet. So this was kind of a violent attack. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Terrifying. Deborah died as a result of a hemorrhage from a cerebral laceration and contusions caused by blunt force trauma with skull fractures. Blood spatter at the crime scene was consistent with Deborah's not having moved after being struck on the right side of the head while lying on the bed. So he claimed that he hit her when she was on the couch, but obviously that's not true. Right, right. Yeah. One of the handprints lifted from the windowsill was later matched to Parker's left palm, and later testing of the semen swabbed from Deborah's body revealed a DNA profile that matched Parker's. 
On February 2nd, 1980, Parker was visiting his brother in Pasadena when he attacked Aida Demergian as she was getting out of her car in an underground parking structure. Mm. So this is different. Yeah. It's outside, mm. not in a home. Mm -hmm. He hit her two or three times in the head with an iron rod. She fell down and pretended to be unconscious, but Parker kept hitting her. The two struggled, but Aida was able to get away and ran for help. She was hospitalized for several days and required surgery and physical therapy to repair a skull fracture and several broken fingers. Shout out to her for surviving. That's amazing. Yeah. Parker was detained about a block and a half away. He was described as calm, cooperative, and compliant and did not appear intoxicated when he was detained and taken into custody. On February 15th in 1980, less than two weeks later, 13-year-old Paula S. attended her father's funeral. At about 3.30 p.m., she was walking home from a store in Tustin where she'd bought her mother a birthday present, and a black van drove past her and pulled over. Parker got out and went around the back of the van as though he were checking the tire. As Paula walked by the van, he grabbed her by the sweater, punched her in the face, and threw her into the van and drove off. Oh. Yeah. While driving, Parker kept looking at Paula through the rearview mirror saying, quote, stay down, stay down, or I'll kill you, oh, unquote. That is terrifying. Yeah. Also, he is like ramping up as far, yeah. you know, this was a terrible thing that he did behind closed doors, but now we're out in the open now and that's he, terrifying. And two weeks between these two attacks. Yeah. So he later stopped in the parking lot of a small shopping center, got into the back of the van, and raped this little girl. Afterward, he asked Paula personal questions. What? Such as what her name was and how old she was. When it was dark, he drove close to where she lived and dropped her off in an alley, threatening to kill her if she told anybody. But when she got home, Paula told her mother immediately what had happened, and the police were called. Paula had noticed that the man had been wearing shiny shoes and police thought he was probably in the military. Mm. An investigation led to Parker, and when interrogated a few days later, he confessed. Later, he commented that it probably saved the girl's life that she was so young. Fuck out of here. That is disgusting. Where's my yeah. shut up? Shut up! <laughs> uh, <laughs> so on May 13th, 1980, Parker was convicted of kidnapping and rape. He was sentenced to six years in prison. And it was this crime that got him dishonorably discharged from the Marines. Wow. In February of 1984, while Parker was incarcerated at the state prison in Tehachapi, California, for the rape, he attacked his cellmate, David Fuertido. While David was sleeping, Parker began hitting him in the back of the head with a curved piece of steel, approximately two feet in length. Where do but you get why? something like that in prison? But why? <laughs> Parker, why? Oh, my God. He just kept, like, helping he himself. Stop. Oh, my yeah. God. So David chased Parker out of the room, but presumably it's a cell, um, and into the hallway, but had to sit down because he was bleeding profusely and almost passed out. The three to four inch cut on his head required stitches, and he stayed in the hospital facility for a week. Parker did not say why he attacked Okay, I'm glad somebody asked, at least. He didn't say <laughs> why he attacked David, but later claimed that David was stealing from him. Okay. Top of the day, everyone. I'm Nisha. And I'm Buddha Badass. And we're the host of Hot Garbage True Crime Edition. Do you guys like true crime? I really don't. I feel like you force me on this show every freaking time I come here. Do you guys enjoy listening to victims and murderers and protest stuff? People that are sick in the freaking head. That's who likes it. That's who likes it. Well, if you like that kind of stuff, then you should totally check us out. I mean, every single Thursday, we drop the most hottest cases, and we have fun while doing it. Uh, you, you drop the most hottest cases? You drop murder and death. Kill. Death. How many people can actually say that they have fun while listening to a true crime podcast? And I feel like that's what we do here. So you're just not going to listen to me now? I'm just going to say this, and you're not going to listen to me? And you know what? 
our listeners are not just our listeners, but they're our friends and our trash pandas. We the, love you guys. They're a lot, and I will agree to that part, but I'm still just mad at you for just not talking to me. They're paying you this well to say all this. So check out Hot Garbage on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Check us out every single Thursday. A new episode drops. I officially hate this commercial. On some real. So now we're going to get into the investigation and the arrest. Hit it, Beth. Parker was in prison in June of 1996 when DNA testing connected him to the five murders and to Diana Green's attack. Law enforcement officers subsequently interrogated him five times about these crimes. I love it when DNA comes through. I really do. (laughs) Um, So at first, Parker claimed innocence. I ain't do nothing. Uh, And when he was confronted with the fact that his DNA matched the evidence in the crimes, he responded, quote, I don't know what to tell you, unquote. Um, (laughs) I'm sure you don't. (laughs) You don't say. So an officer asked Parker if he had ever experienced violent tendencies on PCP or if it was possible he had, quote, met a girl, saw a girl, followed a girl home, and then whatever happened, happened, unquote. Parker didn't think he, quote, could forget something like that, unquote. Hmm. He continued to deny culpability until later that day when he said it was possible he had killed someone while under the influence of drugs because sometimes he blacked out and would do and say things he didn't remember. Interesting. Blame it on the goose. Got you feeling loose. Blame it on Patron. Got you in the zone. Blame it on the alcohol. Blame it on the alcohol. So that's what he's doing. That's what he's saying. Yeah. So finally, that afternoon, Parker confessed to the homicides. He began with Diane Green's attack, saying, quote, I believe that there is a man on death row because of something that I did. And out of all these murders and the crimes that I committed over the years, that was the one that bothered me the most, unquote. When asked, how many women do you think you attacked? Parker was not sure. He couldn't recall his first attack. But he did deny attacking any women in other states where he had been stationed. But I wouldn't be surprised if he had. I wouldn't either, friend. Um, So Parker claimed his intent had been only to knock the women unconscious so he could sexually assault them. He claimed it never occurred to him that he was killing the women because once in a fight, he had knocked his opponent out by hitting him in the head with a two by four. And this did not kill that man. So, yeah, so the logic. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So I didn't do it. Can't take me to jail. Bye. And in June of 1996, Kevin Green, uh, Diana Green's husband, was released from custody after an Orange County Superior Court judge set aside his convictions and dismissed the case against him. Finally, though, that's a long time. So now we're going to get into the trial. Well, let me tell you what happened. All of Parker's interrogations were audio or video recorded. These recordings were played for the jury, and transcripts of the recordings were provided to the jurors. Parker presented no evidence during the guilt phase and engaged in limited cross-examination of the prosecution's witnesses. In opening and closing arguments, the defense conceded identity, but relied on Parker's statements to argue he was guilty of only second-degree murder based on diminished capacity due to intoxication. But he was found guilty. No, really? whoa oh my gosh the system it looks like in this instance the system did work it worked yeah at the penalty phase the prosecution relied on the facts and circumstances of the murders including the impact on the victims families and introduced evidence regarding the additional acts of violence so the attack on Paula mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. David so and many Aida. examples yeah yeah, yeah. unfortunately Parker testified on his own behalf, and Albert Garcia also testified on his behalf. Hmm. Also presented was the expert opinion of a forensic psychiatrist. Parker had been diagnosed with organic mental syndrome, Hmm? a psychological issue caused by brain damage, unspecified psychotic disorder, chronic alcohol abuse, and major depression. Hmm. However, the prosecution's expert forensic psychiatrist diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder, or psychopathy, and Parker was sentenced to death. So now let's get into where are they now? Tell us, Beth. 
Well, Parker is 68 years old and is currently incarcerated at San Quentin Prison. Oh. And uh, he's still on death row, but uh, wow. it's California. Yeah. So. so he'll be there for a while. For, <laughs> Indefinitely, yeah. I guess. Yes. In October 1999, Governor Gray Davis awarded Kevin Green $620,000 in compensation for the years he spent in prison for a crime he did not commit. He moved to Missouri where his parents lived and remarried. Diana and her parents still held Kevin partially responsible for the attack. Diana claimed that Kevin beat her and left her semi-conscious in the couple's apartment just before Parker entered through an unlocked kitchen door and struck her with a two-by-four and raped her. Now, I can't remember in the the episode, the yeah. TV show, was Col- Diana, yeah, yeah, Cold Case, was Diana ever interviewed? I don't remember Not, seeing her. No, no. Yeah, okay. Not there. Okay. So Kevin denies ever striking his wife, but has said he does feel partially responsible because he left her alone in an unlocked apartment. Diana filed a wrongful death lawsuit shortly after Green's conviction and won a multi-million dollar judgment by default Mm. because Green was incarcerated. When he was freed from prison in 1996, Kevin filed a countersuit to have the judgment thrown out. An Orange County Superior Court judge voided the original judgment, but allowed Diana to file an amended lawsuit. However, he encouraged both sides to settle instead of going to trial. In December of 1999, they settled, finally bringing closure to the two-decade-long legal ordeal for Kevin Green, and also for Diana. Yeah, although her ordeal is never going to be over. Right, right, right. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. So now we're going to get into what we think made Parker Snap and our takes. What do you think, Beth? Well, a couple of things stuck out to me on this story. Okay. I've mentioned them already Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, here and there. mm -hmm. Uh, One is that he claimed he was abusing drugs and alcohol, but nobody reported that they saw him intoxicated and he was like doing his job Mm -hmm, and stuff like that. mm -hmm. So was he really good at hiding it or was he lying? Mm. I don't know. But I tend to think he's a liar. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Say more. Tell me more. Something else that we didn't really get into was that he often claimed when the women were sleeping that they were sleeping in the nude. Yes. But they weren't. Right. (laughs) Their clothes were pulled or torn off of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what the hell is that? Great question. (laughs) Was he trying to say something like they deserved it because they were sleeping in the nude? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Because back before we as a society knew, knew better or as a society knew better, that was common. Well, what were you wearing? Yeah. And now true. nowadays you would get slapped for saying that for to that, somebody who'd yeah. been attacked. But back then, part of me thinks because he was so manipulative yeah. that that was a that was a, well, a, you know, yeah. she was sleeping yeah, in she, the nude. Yeah, exactly. So, it feels like yeah. it feels victim blamey and at the time was probably acceptable i don't know to say that like the one where the lady fell asleep in front of her couch and he said she was naked you know yeah i mean it's possible yeah but not not likely that i agree a woman would would do that yeah Uh, yeah i I couldn't agree it's just weird yeah Yeah. like (laughs) i I, yeah i mean i don't know i've never been a nudist i have had nudist friends i know people yeah yeah, i know people who like to not wear clothing so uh, it is possible but yeah it's not likely it does seem far-fetched but yes and the crime scenes often didn't fit his narrative. Mm-hmm. Like we talked about, he would say that he attacked these women when they were asleep mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. they didn't know he was there. Mm-hmm. But uh, the evidence suggested there was a struggle. Yeah. In any case, it seems to me that he was a habitual liar and very, very angry and violent. I and, agree. Uh, hated women. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And I think a lot of that has to do with the loss of his mother early on in life yeah and even though it wasn't his mom's fault that she died no i can see in a little boy's mind feeling like she left me yeah and i will grant that his his childhood was sad oh yeah and according to his cousin or his auntie who raised him Mm -hmm. his his mother was a wonderful mother yeah her loss devastated Mm -hmm. parker Mm -hmm. and he experienced a double abandonment from the death of his mother and then when his dad abandoned the family. So there was both of those yeah, abandonments. a lot in a little amount of time for a little person yeah. to process. A young person. And, um, yeah. you know, he, 
I doubt he got any mental health help, uh, given the time period. The time yeah. period, yeah. And it seems evident, um, you know, by those diagnoses that were thrown out during the trial that no help was ever administered or rendered to him, you know? Yeah. And, you know, my thoughts... Um, I felt immediately looking at the time frame that he probably was angry, not just because of what happened in his family, but also I think about what what America was like in yeah. the late seventies. Like there was it was a shitty it time a, for I a mean, black man to grow yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and unemployment and poverty and war and displacement and um. I don't know if Reagan was in in office yet, but not yet. Yeah, no. the, it eight, was nineteen eighty. Okay, yeah. so. You know, it was it was a lot, a lot. There was a lot to be angry about. And yeah, he um, seemed to me like he was never really able to connect, particularly with people of the opposite sex. You know, he never had or a, or very many people, period. In general, His only yeah, friend was, yeah. yeah, he only the had one, one friend. Yeah. And I understand why he turned to substances to cope. Right. The opposite of addiction is connection. Is That's what they say in all these like woo woo we get well places um <laughs> but but did he though because um obviously he did dabble yeah in yeah. some drugs but was and he alcohol, really addicted but was and was it as bad as he said yeah i am not sure because again he said a lot of things i think to minimize yeah his his crimes. actions yeah. right yeah yeah. And so maybe and it was also suggested to him. Yes. By a police officer. Yeah. Well, were you doing doing we're drugs? <laughs> doing <laughs> drugs. Yes. And then he just went with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, if the police is suggesting that, you know, it could have been drugs. Yeah, I'm just that's gonna go exactly with it. what. Yeah, yeah that's that's totally. exactly what yeah. happened. Officer, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh so I understand why he would have been angry i i don't think it's uh necessary i don't think it's unjustified what is unjustified is is no, how what he, he did yeah, with what that he anger. did with that yeah. anger and i just think of so many i mean even though mental health wasn't a topic of conversation especially in the black community at the time taking care of ourselves has always been important right our health has always been important being well has always been important so i don't know i i guess I'm disappointed that there was never anything available to him to help him with these issues because maybe people's lives could have been spared. Yeah. And then the husband served so much time for yeah. a crime he didn't commit. Yeah. And it was hard time. Yeah. Hard time. And according to the Innocence Project, there are like 20,000 wrongfully convicted people in prison at any given time. Wow. And wow. I'm surprised it took so long for him to get out. And I was sort of struck by the idea that when a white woman is harmed or lots of white women are harmed, it's almost like, and I'm taking, this is a big swing, a big generalization, but the powers that be devote all of the resources and then some to get the guy and stop white women from being hurt. You know what I mean? That and, and the baby. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. White women and white babies. Yeah. And so that sort of struck me because there may have been reasons to investigate the husband, but there wasn't enough reason to convict him. Yeah. And that is fucked up. Also, yeah. um, Parker's confession, I did listen to um, recordings of him speaking. I don't know if it was his confessions or or police interviews or whatever, but just th speaking. Yeah, yeah. He sounded very like matter of fact. Very clinical, absent of emo emo emotions, <laughs> emotion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it made me wonder if like all that loss that he suffered as a young kid, like the lights went out on the part of his being yeah. that was capable of connection and empathy. Yeah. And all the really human emotions like that he just shut it off. Yeah, back it just, then. Yeah, yeah, it just turned off. And so and which would answer why he was such a good Marine. Oh, my God. I'm done. I'm retired. That's it. This <laughs> this episode's going to the Hall of Fame. We're never recording again. Yeah. Wow. For real. I mean, they said it was like a kind of a high pressure position he was in and he got praise for, you know, his work. Yeah. Whoa. Friend. Perfect for the Marines. Also on the serial killer bingo card. <laughs> yeah, the military. Yeah, yeah, military service and head injuries. Wow. Yeah. 
Okay, well, let us know what you think. You know how to find us. Now we're going to move on to the how not to get murdered section of our show. If you love true crime and you don't want to die, here's a tip for you. (laughs) (laughs) This segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. So it looks like you've got a good tip here, Beth. What is it? Well, my only thought was, uh, you know, going through this story yeah. was uh, keep your windows and your doors locked. Absolutely. At all times. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I've talked about that before, yeah. how I lock every, every goddamn thing I can. <laughs> and- <laughs> yeah. You know what is, is I, I lock the door as soon as I open and close it, like I always lock yep. doors behind me and um, yep. I've gotten into trouble with, you know, old Whitey being mad that he's locked out of the house. But <laughs> I mean, what's the alternative? I don't want to get yeah. murdered. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, it's it just becomes a habit. Yeah. 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 And then I also found a link for DIY ways to secure your home. And I'll put it in the show notes. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Now that summer is approaching, more people will have their windows open. And so yeah. you got to consider a way to, to get through the summer and be safe. Yes. Safe girl summer. Ow. <laughs> um, so now we're going to get into the shout out portion where we shout out any content by people of color, or any marginalized folks or any true crime goodies. And I've got a true crime goodie and content okay. by a person of a marginalized background. And nice. it's a podcast called The Tea is Toxic, Ooh. hosted by AJ, who is a black woman. And it's about people, celebrities and historical moments in time that were toxic and unforgettable. Ooh. And then the other thing I wanted to shout out was an Instagram account, an Instagram or TikTok that is just a fun follow. So it's called Black Menaces, like Dennis Ooh. the Menace, but Black Menaces. Right. And um, it's like a social media activist group of students at BYU, you know, the Mormon College in Utah. And they th- apparently black kids do go there. Anyway, they interview <laughs> other students on camera about race, faith, equity and political topics. And all they mean to do by being quote unquote menaces is just asking uncomfortable questions and pushing students around them to grow. To think about. Yeah. To think about stuff. all these things. Yeah. yeah. Cause these black kids have to think about this stuff all the time. So yeah. Nice. What do you got? Oh, I just wanted to shout out a show called criminal record on Apple plus. Mm. It's a British crime thriller series starring Peter Capaldi and Chris Jumbo. Okay. It's set in London and deals with themes such as police brutality, racism, miscarriages of justice, and misogyny. And I haven't finished it yet, but so far it's really good. Like I'm on the edge of my seat to figure out what's going on. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it, whenever I hear that Beth is like super captivated by, that's all I know. It's like it's got to be really good. like it's undeniable <laughs> yeah, at this point. It's good. <laughs> yeah, and Peter Capaldi is he's a kind snack? of an asshole. Oh no, no, it, it, he's not a snack. No, no, no snacks. <laughs> Sorry, detected? Peter. Oh no. Sorry, Peter. Um, he's an older guy, but he is so good. He's such a good actor. Oh, and he plays kind of an asshole mm-hmm. in the show. Mm-hmm. And the looks. Oh, my God. He's so good. <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. OK, so I can't wait until it's off of Apple Plus. But for now. And somewhere yeah, else. Yeah. For, for now, now, that's where you find it. OK, awesome. Yeah. So just to recap, that is The Tea is Toxic, a podcast wherever you get your podcasts. An Instagram or TikTok account just for fun called Black Menaces and a TV program on Apple Plus called Criminal Record. Oh, my, my, my. That's the end of the program. No big deal. We'll be back in the meantime. <laughs> we'll be back. Yeah. Yes. Where can the people find us, Beth? Our website is fruitloopspod.com, and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all of our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show. Also, join us on Patreon, where we have literally hundreds of hours of bonus content. And... You can join us for stuff. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're doing a video club soon. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, if you're in the right tier, you can join us on the video club. Yeah. Absolutes. And you can also support us by supporting our sponsors. 
or by giving us a five-star review. Five stars only, please. (laughs) Also, don't forget to subscribe. Mm -hmm. And if you are listening to us and you're subscribed to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Google Podcasts, uh, you got to find a new podcast app and subscribe to us there. Yeah. It's uh, being sunset. Yeah, it's sad because yeah. I really like it Google is. Podcasts. Yeah, it was my favorite. In, in my yeah. head, I'm thinking that Google's going to be like, just kidding, we won't get rid of it. Too many people like <laughs> use it, but they probably yeah. are not. So yeah. I too have to find a new app. Yeah. But uh, this is a weekly podcast and new episodes drop every Thursday. So until next time, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. Deal. Deal, deal, deal. No deal. Deal. No deal. <laughs> um, okay, quick sip. Having maybe trouble you're still, with frogs maybe in your my cough throat. Is, is not yeah, as gone as you think still, it is. Still hanging out. I rebuke out. you, yeah. cold. <laughs> <laughs> Doing <We're> drugs. <laughs> Doing drugs. Yes. And then he just went with it. At about... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I was going to start reading your part. Oh. <laughs> go, go if ahead. you want sorry. to, you can. Okay. <laughs> uh, jazz. Is there jazz in it? <laughs> Do we get any jazz? <laughs> Is there any jazz in the story? <laughs> I'll stop. No. Okay. There's no jazz in okay. the story. Okay. Hang it. <laughs> Sad face. Sad face emoji. <laughs> I saw we. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um... And that's uh, really all I can think about right now. <laughs> uh, so, um, Deborah C. Nope. Blah, 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 blah. On October 20th, uh, 19th. Sorry. That's okay. No, I, like, I nope. saw myself making the mistake and then thought I could recover by speaking more, and I couldn't. So, you and me. Yeah. What you Together. You, yeah. You with blood type. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, you said to me once because we were doing a blood drive at work or something and um, uh-huh. I was like hey what type are you and you were like I don't know so I remember like this oh positive <laughs> and I was like what a good way to remember and I'll never forget it now <laughs> that's hilarious do you even remember that exchange I don't, okay. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe you okay <laughs> All right. Ta-ta. Love you. Night-night. Love you, too. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Do you enjoy science, spooky stories, and all things paranormal? We do, too. While we would love for most paranormal stories to be true, we are here to tell you that they probably aren't. But that doesn't make them any less fun to speculate about. We are the Spooky Science Sisters podcast. In this podcast, we bring you bi-weekly discussions on possible scientific explanations behind the supernatural. Backed up by research articles and other credible sources, we do deep dives into things like archaeology and physics and share in-depth discussions with topic experts. Visit us at SpookySciencesters.com to listen to a couple of skeptics debunk some of your favorite alien encounters, cryptid sightings, and ghost stories with science, sass, and a significant amount of laughter. Thank you and stay spooky.